Good morning. What a gift it has been to be together so far. Um, thank you for uh, all that you brought to our day together yesterday, um, your hearts and your souls and your minds. Um, this morning, our topic will build on our discussion of lament yesterday by focusing on what I am calling the divine politics of lament. I mean this phrase, the divine politics of lament, in two related ways. First, as we will see, in the biblical tradition, lament is one way that the word of God intrudes into human politics. Right? In this sense, lament is part of Israel's prophetic tradition. By voicing their grief and their anguish, those who suffer at the hands of oppressive kings and empires call these rulers to divine account. But when I speak of the divine politics of lament, I'm also referring to the way that lament calls God to account. In the biblical tradition, to lament is also to lift one's anguish into the sight of God, to insist that God sees, that God hears, that God witnesses the suffering and the grief of God's children. Look, God, it says, look, now, what are you going to do about it? In this way, lament engages with the old theological problem, often referred to as theodicy. How is it that a good and loving God can permit evil? This, of course, is how the question is classically framed. I don't need to remind you today what a pressing question this is. As we watch a world ravaged by war, with men and women and children murdered first in Israel and then in Gaza, as we brace for an ecological and therefore also human disaster that is already sowing famine and floods and fire and fear and mass extinction on an unprecedented level, as we witness the rise of totalitarianism sweeping across the globe from China to Europe to these United States, we who have not given up on God cannot evade the question, what kind of God could allow this? In the Hebrew Bible, there's one central episode in Israel's history that serves as a focal point for these sorts of questions, the destruction of the temple and the exile to Babylon. How could God permit God's beloved city, Jerusalem, to be destroyed? How could God allow God's beloved children to be decimated, brutalized, and exiled? The most visible answer we find in the Hebrew Bible is one offered by a cluster of texts, including Deuteronomy and Jeremiah, who see the destruction of Jerusalem as punishment for Israel's unfaithfulness to the covenant. In short, we sinned, these writers say, and God is punishing us, just as God promised. So in Deuteronomy 28, if you will not obey the Lord your God, this is Moses, um, but probably articulated, put into Moses' mouth after the events of the exile, reflecting knowledge of the exile that would to come. If you will not obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments and decrees, which I'm commanding you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. The Lord will send upon you disaster, panic, and frustration in everything you attempt to do until you are destroyed and perished quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. When the exile does occur, in the wake of the, of the exile, the writer of Lamentations writes, the Lord is in the right for I have rebelled against his word. Right? The destruction of Jerusalem is God's righteous judgment upon a people who earned it. The Lord has done what he purposed. He's carried out his threat as he ordained long ago, the kind of thing we read about in Deuteronomy. This theological understanding is often referred to as Deuteronomistic theology because it, it's articulated so clearly in Deuteronomy. It may sound dark, depressing, and downright dangerous. 
an exercise in blaming the victim for the suffering that the victim experiences. And certainly this theology can and has been abused. But I want us to also notice how this logic carries alongside it an essential corollary. We sinned and God is punishing us, yes, but that also means that if we repent, God will forgive and restore. Back to Deuteronomy. When all these things have happened to you, the blessings and the curses that I have set before you, if you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you and return to the Lord your God, and you and your children obey him with all your heart and your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you, even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth. From there, the Lord your God will gather you. From there, he will bring you back. In other words, by making suffering comprehensible, by making it part of God's foreordained plan, Deuteronomy and other texts that articulate this theology offer a sort of paradoxical consolation. It offers Israel a kind of agency a sense of having its fate in its own hands, or even more profoundly, its fate is in God's hands. A God who punishes, yes, but who ultimately is faithful and wants to restore. We are not just powerless victims, these texts assert, but people who can, if we choose, repent and be restored. This is probably the dominant perspective on suffering that we, uh, particularly the suffering of Israel's exile that we find articulated in the Hebrew Bible. But it's not the only one recorded in the Hebrew Bible. The very diverse collection of texts that is Israel's scriptures also preserves a tradition of lament that addresses the problem of suffering from an entirely different angle. These texts do not presume to answer the question of why God allows God's children to suffer. Instead, they do something completely different, something bolder. They throw the question back at God, even brandish it in God's face. In the ritual practice of lament, Israel's bereaved gather up their dead and their wounded, and they refuse to take, you deserved it, as an answer. So, for example, in the wake of the destruction of Jerusalem, the writer of Lamentations grieves. My eyes are spent with weeping, my stomach churns, my bile is poured out on the ground because of the destruction of my people, because infants and babes faint in the streets of the city. Words that sound uh, terrifyingly timely now. Look, God, look, the writer says. Look, O Lord, and consider, to whom have you done this? Should women eat their offspring, the children they have born? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? The young and the old are lying on the ground and in the streets. My young women and my young men have fallen by the sword. In the day of your anger you have killed them, slaughtering without mercy. Look, God, look. Notably, references to this sort of lament often sit alongside statements of the Deuteronomistic theology we saw a moment earlier. Look, for example, at Jeremiah chapter 8. Here, hark the cry of my poor people from far and wide in the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? In other words, look, God, why aren't you showing up for your people? And then notice the switch here to God's voice. Why have they provoked me to anger with their images, with their foreign idols? It's as though Jeremiah uh, can't help himself but articulate the official theology of the, right, the approved theology that, that punishment is, or that exile is a punishment for sin, um, interrupts his grieving. Or maybe, as some scholars think, this is an interpolation that was added to this text as it was later edited to reflect that, that theology. Either way, Jeremiah, of all people, knows the approved theological answer, right? Israel has sinned, and God is right to judge. And yet he weeps. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? 
Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? Oh, that my head were a spring of water, my eyes a fountain of tears, so that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. Jeremiah's tears, his vocalization of the people's distressed pleas, I think of as a sort of theological remainder, the leftover shards of grief and dismay that his theological commitments can't absorb. Caught between theodicy and lament, Jeremiah says, yes, God, your punishment is righteous, but your mercy would be even more righteous. In the Hebrew Bible, then, lament, whether personal as an expression of individual loss or communal, grieving the fate of Israel, lament insists on the infinite worth of God's children. It doubles down on the conviction that God made us, God chose us, God loves us, and therefore that suffering and death cannot be right, simply cannot be what God finally intends. The practice of lament takes the grief of a suffering people and crafts it into a theological provocation. Look, God, look. And this means that perhaps counterintuitively, lament is in inevitably entangled up with hope. Lament is, in fact, the refusal to give up hope, the dogged insistence that things can and should be different, that in the end, God does care. This, then, is what I mean by the divine politics of lament. I will get into some more details in a moment. Before I do that, one additional point. Like most political arrangements, the politics of lament is a deeply gendered politics. It's no coincidence that although many of the formal prayers of lament that we find in the Hebrew Bible were likely written by men, texts like Lamentations and the Psalms of Lament, there are numerous indications that the work of lament was primarily the work of women. We'll see that as we go along, and especially of grieving mothers, women for whom no amount of theological mansplaining could convince them that the loss of their children was justified. A voice is heard in Rama, lamentations and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. These weeping women who refuse to be comforted will be our guides this morning as we get into the topic. I'm going to approach this in three movements, three acts, you might say. Starting by looking at the practice of ritual lament in the ancient and modern worlds. Then we'll go on to talk in more detail about grieving mothers and the politics of life and death. And then finally, in a way that I hope is relevant to our Lenten season, we'll look at divine grief in the Gospel of Luke. So I want to begin by noting that when we talk about lament in this context, I'm referring to something more specific than simply the expression of grief, although the expression of grief is certainly part of the equation here. Lament was a genre of ritual performance, as, as we noted yesterday, part of Israel's cultural and religious tradition. And in fact, ritualized practices of lament have traditionally been part of the folk cultures, we might say, of many of the world's peoples where, again, women often play an important, although culturally ambivalent, role. Um, when Yemeni Jews, for example, sit Shiva, formal religious ceremonies are supervised by men. Rabbis and religious scholars deliver sermons and lead prayers in Hebrew, the approved language for formal religious ceremonies. In other words, men oversee the practices that are prescribed by what some anthropologists call the great tradition, right? The formal elite controlled practices that are often encoded in written texts. But the acute emotional work of grieving the dead is traditionally led by women who preserve their own ritual tradition, informal and unwritten, part of what some anthropologists have called the little tradition. Practices of lament that have the characteristics of ritual but lie outside the approved male-dominated religious tradition. Tellingly, these women lament not in Hebrew but in Arabic, the language of everyday speech. Theirs is an alternative expression of cultural power. And it's the work of these wailing women to lead the community, to guide it through its experience of death and loss. 
I want to read you here a brief excerpt um, from a book on a book about the grieving practices of Yemeni Jews by a scholar named Tova Gamliel, um, where she provides us with a typical scene. In one hand, the whaler clutched a small cloth kerchief that she pulled tight over her eyes. Her body, all of it, rocked right and left on the chair. Her other hand made circular motions that illustrated lyrics, which she enunciated in a sad, warbling melody about the deceased and his family. He had been kind-hearted and pious, she sang, and above all, he had been pure as everyone knew. Those around her, the women seated close by, burst into weeping at the sound of her voice, pressed toward her in a cozy circle until the moment she stopped, pausing to lift her sad eyes and observe the audience's tears. Notice here that for those who are gathered to mourn, this woman's song of lament is at once unique, customized, you might say, for the specific occasion, but also familiar, improvised from a cluster of traditional motifs and melodies, much as a pastor now might pull together an assortment of familiar biblical phrases into a benediction that suits a specific audience and occasion. In this cultural space, as I've said, um, in many cultures, in this space, as in many other cultures, the whaler is almost always an older woman. The whaler begins to wail when she's well up in years, says one of uh, Gamliel's informants, when she begins to understand life, to understand sadness. She gives birth to a child. She knows what sadness is. Notice the intuitive connection that the speaker makes here between birth mothering, and the grief of death. As though for married women in this traditional culture, the death of a loved one is the culmination of a series of painful separations that constitute the landmarks of mothering. Birth, weaning, marriage, and now, now this unspeakable loss. She knows what sadness is. And of course, the profound existential connection between birth and death is all the more profound, where childbearing itself is tinged with the threat of mortality. This is a connection we'll see again when we come to the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus responds to wailing women by rehearsing the intimate labor of motherhood. The days are surely coming, he says, when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. To bear children is to learn suffering. Modern Western readers have not always known what to make of the sorts of ritual practices of lament we see here. Specifically, the suggestion that lament is a skill that some women cultivate raises questions for m many in modern Western cultures about the authenticity of the grief that they experience. In many parts of the ancient world, and in some other traditional cultures as well, wailing was or is a profession. Women were paid to attend funerals and lead the grieving. This is likely what we see in Matthew's version of the story of the raising of Jairus' daughter. Here, the local leader, if you know the story, is wealthy enough to hire a crowd of flute players to lead the mourning. When Jesus came to the leader's house, Matthew 9, and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion. Uh, it's the sort of scene uh, that we see, for example, on this, um, on this relief, which dates from the first century BCE. You can see on the right of your, the bottom right, you can see the people, uh, the flautists, who are leading the procession uh, in front of the beer that's being carried. The Mishnah, a later rabbinic source, prescribes that even the poorest husband in Israel should hire at least two flute players and one wailing woman for his wife's funeral. Now, American funerals often involve paid musicians and, and typically paid clergy, but we tend not to hire mourners, right? We might ask a professional to say a few words, but not to shed a few tears. And I think it's worth pausing to wonder why. Why does it seem natural to us to pay a speaker or to pay a singer, but not to pay a weeper? Notice how I'm framing the question. I'm asking, what are our culturally embedded presuppositions that make some of these things feel natural and others not? 
Comparative anthropologists and historians of emotion have noted that one of the distinctive characteristics of modern Western conceptions of, of emotion, it's actually idiosyncratic in the history of the world's cultures, but we think of it as natural, um, is a deep investment in the so-called authenticity of emotion, which is often considered to be equivalent to spontaneity. Real emotions happen to us, we often assume, as if a force from outside. They're essentially involuntary. Of course, this presumption doesn't create much space for the hiring of emotional laborers who lament for money, right? Aren't they just acting, their feelings false or put on? And so it's easy, it has been easy for Western observers to be dismissive of professional mourners as a quaint, primitive relic. One Western observer of a Korean funeral wrote in 1911 uh, in, a, in a report, anthropological report, this wailing is done according to fixed rules and cannot be looked on as an outburst of grief and sorrow. Notice the assumption here, right? If there are rules, it can't be grief and sorrow. Grief and sorrow has to be a spontaneous outburst. My suggestion is that this evaluation, again, tells us more about the peculiarity of our own cultural assumptions, uh, reminds us how Western habits of thought have valorized spontaneity and are suspicious of tradition. As always when we approach cultural difference, not least the cultural difference we find in the past, it seems to me a good idea to avoid condescension here to resist the assumption that the practices of others are primitive or unenlightened and back or backwards, and ask what could we learn from these cultures about being human that we may have forgotten. Consider the words of one uh, Yemeni Jewish whaler. Whenever I wail, I remember what I've gone through. There's something subtle happening here. The whaler is paid to be there. She begins her lament because it's her role. It's her social obligation. This is a, a role she plays in society. But as she wails, as her body begins to enact grief, she begins, in fact, to feel grief. Or rather, to remember the feeling, to remember the feeling in her body of grieving. And then so do those who listen, who break out weeping themselves at the sound of her voice. In the end, she and her fellow grievers are not only feeling grief for the person who has recently died, although they are feeling that grief. Rather, her wailing summons up and then draws on a deep reservoir of pain and loss. Whenever I wail, I remember what I've gone through. This woman chooses to enter into her pain in order to gather together a community of mourning. It's as though her wailing opens a door that the community usually keeps shut. Because what's inside is painful, even potentially paralyzing. That door can't be open all the time. But it is also deep, deeply sacred, and sometimes someone needs to be brave enough to open the door. I find this image of the skilled wailer, the professional mourner, very suggestive for thinking about the emotions involved in our own Christian rituals of preaching and of worship. Clergy and worship leaders are, in the language of cultural anthropology, ritual experts, whose task consists in part of what is sometimes called emotional labor. By choosing to access their own feelings, by quite intentionally drawing on their own reservoir of longing and pain, or sometimes of gratitude and joy, those who preach and pray and sing help God's gathered people to touch their own longing and pain, and sometimes gratitude and joy. Now, it's certainly true that this kind of emotional labor can sometimes be exploitative or manipulative. My point is here that it doesn't have to be. And for those of us who oversee religious rituals, and therefore inevitably find ourselves exercising influence on the emotions of others, I think it's important to reflect on the ethics of our emotional performances, including our performance of lament. And maybe that's something we can talk about more in the discussion time afterwards. 
So what does ritual lament accomplish? Uh, this, in other words, to return to our question from yesterday, in the cultures I've been speaking of here, how is lament a gift? Here I'm going to have to speak generally, um, noting what I hope is common ground among a diverse set of cultural locations. But first of all, ritual lament honors the one who has died by dramatizing their loss. In this sense, ritual lament is a bit like lowering the flag to half-mast or like a moment of silence. It's a public display of honor that validates the grief felt by those who feel the loss most keenly. Sometimes you might almost say that tears are the currency by which the worth of the person who has died are, is calculated. Use saliva for your mother, one Jewish whaler says, referring to the common practice of wiping saliva on her eyes to, si uh, to simulate tears, a kind of techno technological shortcut uh, that gets used at some funerals. No, for her I'll cry for real, this whaler says. In contrast, if the mourners don't weep very much, the perception in this community is that they haven't adequately honored the one who's lost. A dog died today, says one person. The people in that house cried a little. Of course, as with all displays of honor, in practice, this can become a kind of competitive economy of tears with rival families broadcasting their importance by hiring large groups of mourners. Um, I'm also reminded here of the story of the Jewish historian and military general Josephus, who's never been accused of being humble, um, who wrote about the scene in Jerusalem where a false rumor spread that he had died. The lamentation, he writes, didn't cease in the city before the 30th day, and a great many people hired flute players to take up the lament. So ritual lament honors the dead. Um, lament also enables mourners to feel their grief. On the face of it, it might seem odd that the bereaved would need help to feel their grief, but our bodies often know more than they let on, and it sometimes takes some coaxing to get them to speak to us. And sometimes we just need to feel alongside others. We need others' help to know our own hearts. Here I might speak personally. When my grandfather died a number of years ago, I received the news by phone. Um, living in California, my grandfather up in Manitoba in Canada, and I was sad, of course. My heart was heavy, but I couldn't cry. Then I arrived at the airport in Winnipeg. My brother greeted me. And as soon as we embraced, I began to weep. And so as I became present with others who would grieve with me, um, I accessed my own tears. Tears, like laughter, are fundamentally relational as in fact are emotions in general. Um, I'm really interested in the science of emotions, and one of the things that stands out to me here is that emotions appear to have evolved only, that is, finely tuned emotions, appear to have evolved only in social animals. Humans, yes, but also whales and dogs and chimpanzees. Because they play an important part in how we engage with each other, how we survive and thrive together. Emotions are not just private feelings. They're a part of how we do life together, an essential social technology. And so to fully feel our grief, we need to feel it with each other. This is something that mourning women among the Wara'o indigenous people in Venezuela know well. They don't have specialists or professionals, but they know very much that wailing is a communal activity. We couldn't cry apart from one another, one woman says we cry very close to one another. The relationality or intersubjectivity of their grieving is evident in the transcription of one grieving family's song. This is one of the most moving musical scores, you might say, that I know of. Um, you can see the mother, the grandmother, and the aunt's voices weaving together here, mingling, overlapping with each other, calling one another forth. This shared experience of grief, the shared experience of grief that this song symbolizes, is central to lament's ability to affirm life in the face of death. When death tears a gaping hole in the community, the knowledge that we are together, that we are feeling this together, gives hope. 
And then finally, lament gathers those who mourn into a multi-generational community of feeling. One of the key functions of ritual practice more generally is to consolidate and harmonize the emotions of the group. This may sound like the exotic sort of thing you read about in cultural anthropology, but you really only have to visit a church on any given Sunday to know that this is true. Whether it's a mainline church with its quiet reflectiveness typically, or the exuberance of a Pentecostal church. Um, when a ritual does what it's intended to do, participants begin to feel the mood that the ritual is designed to evoke. And more than that, we come to notice that we're all feeling the same thing. We feel it together, and this amplifies the feeling. It creates what the sociologist Emil Durkheim called collective effervescence. And this leads to a deep feeling of belonging or solidarity for those who resonate with this shared experience. I might note as an aside, it also can create a deep feeling of alienation and isolation for those who don't resonate with the experience, as anyone who sat through a church service that just did not connect with them can attest. This collective effervescence can, isn't only fueled by positive joyful emotions, it can also be fueled by the sharing of grief that create the shared experience can create a sense of solidarity and belonging. Um, and this includes, importantly, not only those who are present. Because the sounds and words and postures of lament are traditional, they evoke a larger community as well. Uh, we grieve alongside mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers, those who share in our grief and in whose grief we share as well. In the compressed, non-chronological temporality of ritual, past and present losses merge, and mourners grieve for their ancestors and alongside their ancestors in the knowledge that they're not alone. This is the sort of dynamic that we see in Second Chronicles. All Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Jeremiah also uttered a lament for Josiah, and the singing men and singing women have spoken of Josiah in their laments to this day. They made these a custom in Israel. They're recorded in the, in the laments. So this past lament for Josiah becomes part of the ongoing accumulative, accumulative tradition of grieving, a custom that collapses the distance between past grief and present grief. Now, as I mentioned, the Hebrew Bible doesn't preserve laments voiced by women. But there are telling hints of the role of women, as I've mentioned, and I want to show you very briefly here. Uh, in 2 Samuel, David laments at the death, deaths of Saul and Jonathan, and in his lament, he pays tribute. It's like a sort of shout out to the real experts. Oh, daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, he says. Similarly, in Jeremiah chapter 9, uh, Jeremiah writes, consider and call for the mourning women to come. Send for the skilled women to come. We are in a crisis. We need those who are practiced in the craft of grieving to come and help us. So this brings me to my second act. And I promise the second and third acts are shorter than the first. So we will not be here all morning. OK, so far we've focused on the role of ritual lament in the formation of a community that cherishes shared life by honoring its dead. But in a world where not all lives are equally valued, the practice of lament can take on a political edge. The Wara'o woman that we saw earlier asked for their lament to be photographed. Their children were dying, they didn't know why, and those outside the indigenous community showed little interest in addressing the crisis. And so they wanted to broadcast their tears as a way of calling attention to their plight. In a context like this, to lament is to reject any political logic that makes some bodies disposable or renders life a cheap commodity. Cheaper sometimes even than cigarettes, whether bought with a counterfeit bill or sold as singles. To lament is to contest the political economy of kingdoms and empires and stock exchanges. An economy that, as the prophet Amos puts it, as though foretelling the modern sweatshop, sells the needy for a pair of sandals. Here it's really no surprise that apart from the weeping King David, kings in the Hebrew Bible seldom know how to grieve. 
To lament, after all, is to acknowledge one's weakness, one's inability to fix things. Trapped in the illusion of their power, kings characteristically deny tragedy, announcing peace, peace, where there is no peace, to quote Jeremiah, or else they respond in a flurry of outrage. Perhaps the most incompetent lamenter in all of the Bible is King Hezekiah. Twice in 2 Kings 20, Hezekiah receives an oracle of doom from the prophet Isaiah. First of all, Isaiah comes to him on his sickbed and tells him that according to the word of the Lord, he will not recover from his sickness, he's going to die. At this, Hezekiah does in fact lament. He pleads with God and weeps bitterly, and in response, God laments and promises healing. Uh, I have seen your tears, indeed I will heal you. And so Hezekiah lives on, wiser we might hope. But later in the same chapter, Hezekiah pulls a typically kingly stunt and shows off to visiting Babylonian emissaries all of his royal treasures. He clearly has more pride than he has wisdom. And again, Isaiah foretells doom. Although this time, he doesn't say that Hezekiah is going to die. He says rather that his wealth in the and his children in the time of the next generation will be carried off into exile by the Babylonians. Um, look how Hezekiah responds. The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought, why not? If there will be peace and security in my days. Here we have an appalling incapacity to lament, to grieve, to value any life other than his own. It's like the oil company executive who says, devastating ecological collapse? Well, why not, if there will be record profits in my days? <laughs> Consider, by contrast, the devastating story in 2 Samuel 21, which illustrates the prophetic power of lament as a political protest. The chapter begins with a famine. One year of famine, well, that happens. Two years, you pray for rain. By the third year of famine, you begin to weather God is punishing you. And so David inquires of the Lord, we are told, and he gets the following response. There is blood guilt on Saul and his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. Now, Israel had sworn a treaty to spare the Gibeonites. Saul has broken this vow, and now it's as though the land itself is in revolt because of the unjust blood that has been spilt upon it. So David summons the Gibeonites and asks them how to put things right. Now, in our setting, we might think of something like reparations, but this is the ancient world, and so they think in terms of the ritual logic of sacrifice. How do we cleanse the land of blood guilt? The cultural assumption here is one we see reflected in the book of Numbers. Blood pollutes the land. No expiation can be made for the land, for the blood that's shed in it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. Now, Saul's not around any longer to punish. His blood can't be shed. So what do the Gibeonites ask for? The man who consumed us and planned to destroy us so that we should have no place in all the territory of Israel, let seven of his sons be handed over to us, and we will impale them before the Lord at Gibeon on the mountain of the Lord. And so, desperate for rain... This is what David does. He hands over seven of Saul's descendants, two sons of Saul's wife Rizpah, and five sons of Saul's daughter Merib, and the Gibeonites put them to death on the mountain before the Lord. From David's perspective, these children appear to be necessary collateral damage, maybe a sad but unavoidable sacrifice in order to restore prosperity to the land. It's the sort of deathly political logic that's familiar to anyone watching the news from the Middle East or from our own southern border. For the security and prosperity of the nation, sometimes a few innocent civilians just have to die. And note that at this point in the text, it seems that God, too, is a party to this arrangement. God, here, seems to be just another one of the political powers negotiating the lives and deaths of these subjects, right? They're going to put them to death before the Lord. So far, this story is appalling and tragic, and it's also depressingly predictable. It's the typical kind of behavior of dynasties and kings. 
But what happens next is surprising and even shocking. Rizpah, whose two sons were killed and who had apparently been left unburied, their bodies exposed shamefully on the mountainside, takes matters into her own hands. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it on a rock for herself from the beginning of harvest until rain fell on them from the heaven. She did not allow the birds of the air to come on the bodies by day or the wild animals by night. Sackcloth, of course, is the traditional garment of mourners, but Rizpah redeploys its potent symbolism, shielding herself with a sackcloth tent, it seems, while holding vigil over her children's bodies. The Gibeonites have left these bodies unburied on the hillside quite intentionally. You might remember from the story of David and Goliath what's in fact a common taunt in the ancient world, that one will make one's enemies food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the fields. In other words, you're not just going to kill their, your enemies, you'll desecrate them, dehumanize them. And it's these desecrating birds and beasts that Rizpah is chasing away. This makes hers a sort of protest vigil, a prophetic act of lament, lament that's enacted rather than spoken. By stationing herself on this mountain, Rizpah will not let David look away to continue on and proceed with kingly politics as usual. Instead, her desperate and creative act of grief draws attention to the horror of her beloved son's murder. Rizpah's protest here always reminds me of another brave mother, Mamie Till Mobley, the mother of Emmett Till, who insisted on an open casket funeral for her brutally murdered son. In the same way, Rizpah refuses to go quietly and her vigil eventually shames David into gathering up and burying the bones of her sons. This, then, is the prophetic politics of lament, the refusal to put a lid on the casket, to let death be swept under the rug as though it were business as usual. Lament here is the stubborn, inconvenient, prophetic mourning of mothers and grandmothers and others who have given life, who have nurtured life, and who refuse to normalize the politics of death. It's the grieving mothers among the Warao in Venezuela, but also in Gaza, in Ukraine, in Sandy Hook, and in Uvalde. Women in whose lament is also an accusation. Look, they say, look. Look at the remains of my children. Now, what are you going to do about it? In reading 2 Samuel, it's important to notice also that Rizpah's political challenge to David's regime is also a theological challenge. Specifically, it contests the royal theology that would make God a partner to the politics of death, as though God intended to solve the problem of bloodshed with more innocent bloodshed, sacrificing Rizpah's sons to redress the death of the Gibeonites. Now here the text is not as explicit as we might like, and I'm hesitant to overread it, but notice this. These seven boys are killed, slaughtered on the mountains, ostensibly to atone for blood guilt and bring an end to the drought. Still, so far as we can tell, it does not rain. After all that, despite the slaughter, the rain doesn't come. When does it finally begin to rain? Rizpah's vigil, the text says, begins with the harvest and continues on until the rains fall. As though her lament is what God finally responds to um, when God finally relents and brings rain. God gives the land rain after David gathers up the bones of the slaughtered and gives them a proper burial. It's after that, we read, that God heeded supplication for the land. Again, the text isn't very explicit about God's role, although many of the actors in the text seem to know exactly what God wants. But perhaps it's fair to say that in this text we catch a glimpse of a God who's more concerned to see that the dead are grieved and that their lives are honored than to see that they're avenged. And this brings us to the final chapter of our story this morning, Divine Grief in the Gospel of Luke. There is a remarkable story in the Babylonian Talmud, uh, which compiled some centuries after the New Testament. A number of rabbis are sitting around discussing wondrous phenomena of creation, stars, storms, wind, lightning, and they happen onto the topic of earthquakes. Different teachers suggest various explanations for why earthquakes happen. 
all, of course, in good rabbinical fashion supported by biblical proof texts. An earthquake is God clapping his hands together in anger, says Rabbi Katina, for it is written, I will also smite my hands together and I will satisfy my fury. No, no, says Rabbi Aha ben Yaakov, an earthquake is just God shifting his feet around on his footstool. As it's written, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. But the Talmud preserves another opinion too, which in fact the text seems to favor even though it has hesitations about the legitimacy of its source. Rabbi Ketina, we're told, was once walking along the road when he came to the house of a necromancer. In other words, a diviner. The word is the same word that gets used uh, for the woman of Endor who conjures up a spirit for, Saint, for King Saul. And as Ketina passes along, an earthquake rumbled. The rabbi said, it would seem intending to mock the limits of the necromancer's knowledge, does this necromancer know what is this earthquake? Overhearing him, the necromancer takes up the challenge. Why would I not know? Certainly, this earthquake occurred because when the Holy One, blessed be he, remembers his children who are suffering among the nations of the world, he sheds two tears into the great sea. The sound of their reverberation is heard from one end of the earth to the other. And that is an earthquake. I began this morning by contrasting two different responses in the Hebrew Bible to the problem of suffering and death. The Deuteronomistic answer, exile, death, and loss are God's just punishment for unfaithfulness. And then the informal, implicit theology of lament that doesn't offer an explanation but rather challenges God to listen and to look. In turning now to the Gospel of Luke, we'll look at yet another take on the divine politics of lament. For here, as in the story of Rabbi Ketina and the necromancer, we find a God who weeps. Interestingly, Luke initially appears somewhat ambivalent about lament. There's in fact a number of passages in Luke where Jesus tells people not to weep. In Luke chapter 8, when Jesus is at the leader of the synagogue's house, I mentioned the version of the story in Matthew earlier, he finds a gathered crowd weeping and mourning. Uh, in other words, he walks in on a wake, and he responds dismissively, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. A chapter earlier, he tells the grieving mother of a dead boy not to weep, as he's being carried along on a bier in a funeral procession, perhaps a procession like this one we saw earlier. Now, these texts don't need to be interpreted as representing any particular hostility to grieving on Luke's part. The point probably is rather that because of Jesus' saving power, which brings these children back to life, weeping is no longer necessary. It's a question of the right time for weeping, not weep whether weeping is okay. But what has really stood out to readers of Luke's gospel is Luke's modification of the story of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Mark's account of this story, which is likely the first version to have been written, this is an intensely emotional scene. Jesus says to his disciples, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, Jesus throws himself on the ground and prays. This is an intensely emotional scene. For later Christians, influenced by Roman Stoicism and heady ideas about divine impassibility, that is, God's insusceptibility to change and therefore God's insusceptibility to emotion, this passage became a little bit of an embarrassment. Writing in the fourth century, the emperor Julian, sometimes called Julian the Apostate, referred uh, to this passage in a harsh critique of Christianity. Jesus prays in such language as would be used by a pitiful wretch who cannot bear misfortune with serenity. And though he's a god, he's reassured by an angel. And then he has to get in there. And who told you, Luke, the story of the angel, if this even happened? Weren't the disciples all sleeping? <laughs> Already in the second century, the Greek philosopher Celsus mocks Jesus for having died a miserable death. 
and compares him to noble philosophers who show contempt for punishment, right? who are not grieved by their experience of death. Here, we should notice, the, again, the gendered assumptions about courage and virtue, where Jesus is being held up to an ideal of a noble male philosopher who can approach death without distress. A real manly hero, let alone a god, would not shy away from death like a terrified woman or slave, is what these philosophers presume. Some readers have suggested that Luke, too, was embarrassed by the scene in Gethsemane. In Mark, we saw Jesus is deeply grieved. Whereas in Luke's gospel, the only people who are explicitly said to be grieved are the disciples who fall asleep because of grief. The language of grief disappears in relation to Jesus. Likewise, in Luke, Jesus doesn't throw himself down on the ground to pray, as in Mark. He rather kneels down to pray, withdrew, knelt down, and prayed, a much calmer gesture. Luke's Jesus does experience anguish, sweat like drops of blood, we read. But this sounds more like a brave, the brave struggle of a spiritual athlete than the kind of desperate, urgent plea that we find in Mark's gospel. And in fact, anguish may not be the best translation here. Um, I think struggle probably captures the sense of the word better. It's a word that gets used, agon, you, gets used in athletic contexts. Moreover, if you look at the footnotes carefully in your Bible, you'll see that scholars continue to debate whether these two verses are in the original text of Luke's Gospel. They don't appear in all the manuscripts. The most recent book to approach this to to cover this topic is 700 pages long, so we won't get into the details here. But it, it, this has helped fuel the idea that Luke is actually hostile to the depiction of a Jesus who feels emotion as he approaches his death. So does Luke make Jesus conform with the Stoic ideal of a man who faces death calmly and bravely? Is his, a gospel, is his a gospel with no scope for lament? To consider this question, we need to move on in Luke's passion narrative to another story about weeping. Here, as Jesus makes his way to Golgotha, a great number of people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. The term translated wailing here does not mean just crying loudly. It refers specifically to the cultural practice of lament, as we've been referring to before. Likewise, beating the breast is a gesture familiar in antiquity. It's the recognizable body language of lamenting women throughout the ancient Mediterranean world. Here's an example from 4th century BCE Egypt. And notice that here, as with Rizpah, the laments of these women in Luke are a creative political act. As elsewhere in the Roman world, in Luke's story, women are mostly excluded from the formal political process. When Pilate and Herod and the chief priests and the leaders of the people debate Jesus' fate, the women aren't invited. So women have no voice in the formal trial, which is dominated by men. But the work of lament is recognized culturally as the work of women. And so these women use what cultural power they have. They can't crash Pilate's headquarters, but they can lament and do it loudly and publicly. And so wailing for Jesus even before he's killed, these women mobilize their traditional role to claim a, a voice for themselves, a political voice, protesting what's happening. And this is a pretty brave protest. For just a few minutes ago, an angry mob is yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus' response to these women may at first look like a rebuke. Do not weep for me, daughters of Jerusalem, he says. We've heard these words before, do not weep, right, in the healing scenes I mentioned earlier. In fact, however, Jesus' words are deeply political too, shot through with the prophetic language of Jeremiah and Hosea, who grieved the fate of God's people many centuries before. The final line of the statement, cover us, fall on us, is a direct quotation of Hosea 10.8, and the rest of Jesus' words are a kind of pastiche of prophetic idioms familiar from Jeremiah that refer specifically to the trauma of war. Indeed, the threat of war looms large throughout the Gospel of Luke. Uh, in verse 
31, Jesus says, if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? This may be a little bit opaque for modern readers, but readers in Luke's time, in the late first century, would have known exactly which dry wood he was speaking of. For in, around, uh, in the year 70 CE, uh, the Romans waged a horrible war, uh, destroying once again the city of Jerusalem, um, carrying slaves uh, and the treasures of the city captive. As we see, this is a triumphal arch uh, in the city of Rome that dates from the, destruction of the, the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, as Jesus puts it earlier in the Gospel, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know its desolation has come near. Woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing infants in those days. Blessed are the barren and those with no children indeed, given the, what, the, what those who have born children are going to experience um, in this horrifying war. From this perspective, Jesus' words in Luke 23, don't weep for me, but weep for what's going to happen to you, reinterpret the women's lament as a prophetic sign of the horror that is to come. In this way, the weeping of these women mirrors Jesus' own lament as he, when he first approaches Jerusalem a week earlier. As Jesus comes near the city, he weeps over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Here, too, the brutality of the war with Rome lurks in the shadows. Indeed, the days will come when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you. Blessed are the barren indeed. And this brings us back to our earlier question regarding Luke's depiction of Jesus in Gethsemane. Luke does not, I think, give us a stoic Jesus, a man who faces death calmly and nobly. Rather, Luke depicts a Jesus who takes his own advice, who weeps, yes, but not only for his own fate, he weeps for the national calamity that it augurs for the men and women and children who would be brutalized and terrorized and killed, terrified and hungry, like those trapped in war zones not so far away from Jerusalem today. There is a long Christian tradition of reading the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 as God's act of judgment on Israel for their role in the death of Jesus. And certainly, the final verse of the passage could be read in that way. They will not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. But I want to insist here that this is not what Luke is suggesting. Jesus' words here are not a threat of divine judgment. They are rather a prophetic lament. Like Jeremiah, Jesus looks upon the city of Jerusalem and weeps. If you, even you, O Jerusalem, had only recognized on these days the things that make for peace. Jesus laments the violence that is sure to come when the path of peace is abandoned. Looking down on Jerusalem, anticipating the horrors that are to come, Jesus sees in his mind's eye the city burning and he weeps. And when a week later he tells the wailing women on the way to the cross to weep not for him, but for themselves and for their children, he's inviting them to join him in his prophetic lament. And this then brings me to my conclusion. The Gospel of Luke does not give us an answer exactly to that old question of why God allows suffering, but it does suggest something that I think is important about where God stands when we grieve, mourning our own dead, or when in horror we're watching our world burn. We will not find God in the justifications and evasions of God's self-proclaimed defenders and spokespersons in the platitudes and pat answers of those who are too terrified to look reality in the eye. No, Luke's story suggests, God is rather standing among those who weep. Like the women of Jerusalem, we're invited to join with the God who is already weeping, 
to participate in a divine lament that's already underway. And as Rizpah's story reminds us, and that of Mamie Till Mobley, when we join our tears with God's, they may not cause earthquakes, but they do have the power to shake the kingdoms of the earth. I'm going to invite my fellow schooler leaders today, Dr. Ellen, uh, Dr. Gibson, Dr. Bridgman, um, to join me here. We're going to have some conversation together about what was provoked by them about this topic, and then we'll invite your questions um, at that point. Well, I'm going to... Um I'm going to start with a question, Dr. Schellenberg, and of course, we, we all can speak to it if we desire. Thinking about professional mourners, who would you say now are the professional mourners in our society, if we have any? And if we do, what do you see as their role? Is it similar to the ancient role? Is it different? If so, how? And where is the church in that? Is the church involved in that, or is that, do the professional mourners kind of stand outside of that? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I see, I don't think anybody's getting paid for it. Um, but I certainly see similar kinds of work in the work of a group like Black Lives Matter, where people are saying, we are not going to take death as business as usual. We're going to grieve that publicly. Um, and we're going to make people notice. And I think that um, I'm not the person most qualified here to speak on the relationship between that work and the work of the church, or how those, how those have been intertwined in the past. Um, but certainly I think there's a place for the church in leading and mobilizing in that way. The piece you did on Arispa and, and connecting it to, of course, uh, Mamie Till Mobley, um, thought that was awesome. And the fact that mothers weeping and the women coming together. Um, in Dr. Bridgman's class at CTS, she shared um, one of her articles, and I forget the name of the article, but it's about when you make the women rise up. What's the name of that, Doc? <laughs> it's, it's an article that Dr. Bridgman writes that speaks to the South African women that uh, rise up. Oh, and now you have touched the rock. Now you have touched the rock, right? The name of the art. Everybody get that article. Now you have touched the rock. But it speaks to um, when the women arise, it's a lot different than when men who get credit for mourning um, so I thought that was a, an amazing piece that you brought out. Now tell me in the text, why is it, is it just patriarchy that the men get the credit for mourning and the women do the work in the background? What, what is that? Is it a thing about women, and I would hate to even say this, um, uh, so I won't say it, about the emotions of women versus the emotions of men, but what is it uh, sociologically that's going on that uh, forces the women to the background and the men are the writers of the lament but really are not the participators? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's primarily about literacy. So it's the division between the, the oral and the textual so that women are not in the ancient world, they do not typically have the education that would give them access to preserving things in texts and so their traditions are preserved orally. And that's why we get only glimpses in the texts which are written by literate, educated men. And of course, that also leaves out the vast majority of the men in the culture who are also not literate. Um, we get the perspective of, of the elite and their scribes um, who were trained for that specific purpose. I want to follow up on the RISPA piece because I want you to talk about the hidden figures. So 
I, when I read that RISPA story, and she is out there for, I think it's like six months, whatever it is, it says that, and I, when I read it, so this is my womanist reading underneath, there's no way she's out there by herself for six months. So it's just not possible. She's got to eat, she's got to sleep. So somebody has to step in to keep vigil when she goes to do that, and I imagine it's other women. Uh, doing that work. So think about about the untold stories in the text yeah. for a moment. Yeah, I love that. That's, I think that's really powerful, both as a reading of that story and a reminder for us that there's a lot of work that go necessarily goes unseen um, in, in supporting the things that do end up becoming visible. Yeah. So what it makes me wonder is, I know I can turn this off, what it makes me wonder is how do we make visible the practices and rituals? Because the other piece that I want you to speak to is the way we have learned, and the we in this sentence is American culture. It may be true of larger Western culture, but I'm talking about American, and I really mean North American, so it would include Canadian as well, where we have come to disdain the, even the notion of ritual. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear people say, I've heard students say, oh, I don't want to do ritual. And I'm like, but, eh. So can you say something about our disdain for ritual? Oh, yeah. I think, I mean, I think that is a deep, deep loss. That is, we are throwing away our, our cultural knowledge and wisdom, the things that have carried us. We're th discarding them and throwing them away. Um, now, that's not... That happens in part because rituals, like any other aspect of tradition, has the potential to get rigid and stagnant. Ritual preserves the memory of the past, but it only connects, it only means when there's the flexibility for that ritual to be renegotiated, for that ritual to be reimagined. Um, and that's part of our work here, right, is how do we take that legacy and make it alive, keep it alive, um, so that it continues to have power. Um, but I think it, but part of what we're up against is this broader, broader set of ideas that see, again, that see what emerges spontaneously from the individual person as the thing that is authentic and is skeptical of tradition more generally. I want, and it, this was part of what came up in my workshop yesterday, that we were focused on the shape of Israel's Psalms of Lament and the power that 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 genre has. Um, it occurred to me, I had everybody write a Psalm of Lament in that room, but I had not in fact done that exercise myself. So I want to report to those of you, <laughs> I want to, and it occurred to me as I was speaking this morning, that, that was my Psalm of Lament right there. Um, so <laughs> you heard me do a slightly different shape, um, but in some ways that, that, that felt, for, this felt for me, uh, this, the experience of focusing on, of working on this, felt to me like an act of lament itself. Uh, Anything else from the panel before we open it to the floor? Okay, so if you have uh, questions, we have time to take maybe two or three. And I want to um, ask a question of all of you, just to think that took Dr. Schellenberg's uh, workshop about writing the laments, if that is something that you see as valuable for your congregations. So just think about that. Um, but the floor is open. The mic. Tess. Is it? Okay. Good morning. Thank you for that. That was, that was powerful. Um, we're thinking about the professional mourners. Immediately I went to the show Good Times and yeah. Weeping Wanda, yeah. right? Weeping, Weeping Wanda. And Wanda, at one, in one episode, she counted the number of times she had gone or she had scheduled all these funerals during the week and the importance of having that. Um, but also, there were a couple of reality shows, uh, the best funeral ever. I had to look them up because I was watching them. Buried by the Bernards and I think it was best funeral ever. And they, you know, they put on these elaborate funerals where they're setting bodies up, but they hire professional mourners for them. So it's still, it's still a thing in the United States. 
interesting. Thank you. Uh, I, let's, for the record, those of you who don't know this time, I know that. <laughs> I just know that. that was way out of the reach for some of y'all. <laughs> but you can go on YouTube and find it. <laughs> Yeah, we, we just dated ourselves. <laughs> Good morning. Um, uh, thank you for um, that lecture. While serving in my first appointment um, in West Lafayette, I was in a very wealthy um, all-white church, 500 in worship on a Sunday. I was the only African-American um, in that building. And... Um, I remember the senior pastor, I was the associate, making the comment, um, you are teaching us how to weep. And so, because you mentioned lament having that gendered um, aspect to it, and then we're talking about it in a cultural sense. And could you say more about what that even looks like in our Western culture in that in some uh, predominantly white churches, it's not okay to lament publicly or to even speak about one's pain. Um, and so through being vulnerable in the pulpit and sharing my own pain, it seemed to open up something in people that they had been holding. But I've noticed that that has been common in several of my um, appointments, whereas in the black church, even in black Methodist churches, people are going to testify. You, you're going to know that Ray Ray got locked up and, and that there's help. And so I'm just noticed that difference. So if you could just maybe speak to that. Yeah, I, th I thank you for that. I used the phrase yesterday, emotional regime. Um, and I think white people live in a stultifying emotional regime that forbids the expression in public places of, of grief and negative emotions more generally, although there's plenty of opportunity for white people to express rage, I suppose. Um, and I think that's, I don't know how we go about tackling that. I don't know what we do. Um, I hope, I hope that the unsettling of the cultural power of white people in the United States has the potential to shake things up. Um, but I was reminded as you were asking your question, my wife has worked as a hospital chaplain. And it is not rare for grieving black families to be told by hospital staff that they're doing it wrong, that they're too loud, yeah. that they cannot be in that hospital room, and they're going to have to go wait outside somewhere. And there are a certain set of expectations around what's permissible and what grieving should look like that... Um, again, I don't know the answer to how we deal with that, but I think your question is right on as far as some of the, some of the poverty of just white culture, if, if there is such a thing. And it, it, it ref I know. Um, it reflects itself also sometimes in white people. I, I, I don't want to be this black and white, but I, sure. in this place I'm going to say this recalling from black emotion mm -hmm. and saying things like, I'm scared. I, I've had people say, oh, you're scaring me because you're so emotional. I'm like, did I threaten you? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm crying or I'm upset. But that doesn't mean anything except for I'm emoting. Yeah. And so it gets reflected as, <laughs> as black people somehow are dangerous because yeah. they're being emotional. And it's okay for cultures to be different. Right. That is, I don't think, I don't think that the solution is, you know, white people have to act more like black people, no. <laughs> right? Um, but we can learn from each other. Right. But don't get bothered if you don't get invited to the barbecue. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I, I also, I want to add something to that. Yeah, please. Um, I think, in my mind, it's not a black or white thing, it's a human thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, people are afraid to allow their humanity to show so often, um, because they are afraid then that all of their preconceived notions mm 
about who they are and who others are will be challenged and possibly dismantled. And so then if I have to question uh, this emotion that I'm feeling that's coming up, if I let that out, then what else have I been wrong about? And that makes me like somebody else. Then what else have I been wrong about? I remember uh, my late brother used to serve uh, a, a white congregation and he said that he was uh, over the music and worship arts and he said they had to sneak communion on the congregation. They could never tell them when they were having communion because many of them would not come because the emotion of communion and the facing of perhaps their own guilt and shame about who they were and how they lived uh, was too palpable for them to face. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, and thank you so much for the lecture. Um, and I was responding to a couple of questions that was raised. One was um, sort of the unhidden people, like at RISPA, and I think of parents of and, and, care, and family members of people who have died by homicide. When you say where are like the laments going on, the vigils that are held uh, mm -hmm. daily, mm -hmm. um, weekly, uh, throughout the nation. Yeah. And I know in the communal prayer work, um, there are groups that even say they're willing women, mm -hmm. that they spend time and give space to that. Um, and so, and when you say where is the church in that, it's, it's almost as if um, these communities had to go outside uh, of the organized bodies. And even though the, um, they are people of faith, they had to sort of settle in another area in order to have the freedom and the liberty to uh, maybe die, cry about their dying children. And then I think about, in the field of behavioral health and mental health, uh, a similar uh, lamentation occurs. Um, and we had that experience just recently in Columbus when, again, um, someone died um, as a result of having a mental health crisis mm -hmm. and the police response mm -hmm. became a fatal one for that person. Um, and so we lament that collectively within that community, um, but maybe not as visible, we're sort of hidden. Um, and so I think about that as well, as where we experience lamentations yeah. and laments. And we write our dirges, um, we gather and we plant healing gardens, and we do a lot of these acts. Mm -hmm. uh, we call law enforcement. Um, they get more training, CIT training, yet we still experience um, the death of a beloved one yeah. and a fellow citizen of our community. Yeah. Thank you, Nettie. Just following up on that, what it reminds me of is after every public death, you will see people will go to the site and leave teddy bears and flowers and notes and whatever. So we are some ways ritualizing our grief. And we'll take these to Courtney and then um, the gentleman here and that, and that will conclude our time. Just wanted to share a reaction to your question of why we don't pay weepers. And I think about how much money we spend on people to help us keep things together when what we really need is just to fall apart. And then just to respond to the uh, needing to surprise people with communion, um, I think people would say, well, I, I go to church to see God, not to see myself. Before I got into the preaching business, I spent 15 years as a high school teacher at a historically black school in Louisville, Kentucky. 
uh, Muhammad Ali. Cassius Clay graduated from Central High School. So during my time there, I, I was in lament with a lot of students. You know, I experienced uh, suicide, homicide, uh, accidents, uh, drug overdoses, just all sorts of things. I've been to funerals and I've seen the way black people respond and it's not, they weren't paid mourners, they were just releasing their grief. And they weren't pretending. But it got to, a, uh, I'm speaking cu culturally now, it got to the point where there was so much grief going on, you know, kids would wear rest in peace, they'd, they'd get t-shirts with pictures of people. And uh, the school administration, which had a black principal, said, we're, no, we're, we're going to have to calm this down. We're going to have to uh, have some sort of a new dress code around these RIP shirts. And in, in, in a faculty meeting, I said, what in the world is going on here? You all, it's natural to grieve, especially when it's your, uh, your father, your mother, your friend, people you're close to. I mean, I've had students whose grandmother, they must have had four or five grandmothers because they said I didn't come to school because I had to go. <laughs> but I just, I just felt a lot of angst about the way the administration was handling kids that were doing what, what was natural. I, I will just say, they aren't the first. The Romans also had a prescribed period for during which women could grieve, and then after that they had to stop. There, was, there were laws about how long you could go on grieving um, to try to control what could sometimes be politically problematic grieving. Can I respond? I would also say that, um, so born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, will be there Saturday. Very familiar with Central and the area. I will say that with the, the RIP t-shirts, while it is a way that um, folks grieve, that, that we grieve. Um, we're getting new t-shirts Saturday to remember my sister's death. She died in 2009. We get new t-shirts every year. But when it comes to the schools, sometimes if the person that has passed away, if it is gang related, if it's related to communal violence, sometimes it's also, it's a statement. So it is a, um, it can also cause infighting amongst folks in the community, especially if I'm wearing the t-shirt that your cousin's cousin killed this person and then you get that t-shirt. And so being someone that's from the hood, raised in the projects, I do understand why they may have done that in the schools. Um, because you can, I could, you could just wear one t-shirt and it sends a specific statement. So I just want to add that. But I understand your hesitation. Well, we certainly want to thank um, Dr. Schellenberg again for his timely and prophetic words. And I want to ask you, Dr. Schellenberg, did you have one last thing you might want to say to us? Um, and then we will exempt until 11, when we will uh, return here for uh, our closing worship. Dr. Schellenberg. I think, frankly, I've said everything I want to say. Uh, and I, I really am looking forward to gathering, um, gathering with you all for worship in a few moments. All right. Well, thank you so much. We'll see you at 11. <laughs>